Depression is a widespread psychiatric disorder and it's the third most common global disability among non-fatal diseases. Unfortunately though, sometimes depression does end in fatality when it results in suicidal thoughts. With the decreased stigmatism surrounding mental health issues that we have nowadays, luckily there has been a lot more research put into finding ways to mitigate depression in individuals. In fact, the most common way to treat depression nowadays targets the monoamine system, which is a neurotransmitter system in the nervous system that seems to be out of whack in individuals that have depression. So ways that depression is treated is by using things like tricyclic antidepressants and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Unfortunately, these methods can be slow acting and it takes at least two weeks for patients to see results, in which time their depression can actually become worse. And it can be dangerous for patients that have suicidal tendencies. And sometimes, even though patients undergo treatment, they might have treatment resistant depression, which is when you can experience two or more different treatment options and see no results with either. But something has surfaced in the last couple of years that seems to be promising. And that thing is called ketamine. Today on NeuroPsyQ, we are actually going to explore whether or not we can find some way to instantly stop depression. And particularly, we're going to be looking at ketamine and the promise that it brings. With that being said, welcome back to NeuroPsyQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe for our weekly neuroscience videos. And if you're coming back, thanks for joining us for another week's video. Sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. So right before I left you with the intro, we were talking about ways that we could probably put a stop to depression. And the method that we are going to be talking about is ketamine. Ketamine was discovered in 1962 and it's actually commonly used as an anesthetic. It was first used in the Vietnam War as an anesthetic and because of how good it is for anesthesiology, the WHO actually listed it as an essential medicine. Now, it's a dissociative anesthetic and it can increase your heart rate and blood pressure because of side effects. It also causes nausea, vomiting, numbness, hallucinations. It can cause respiratory issues. Amnesia is another thing. One of the most specific things that you see with ketamine is called the K-hole, which is when people experience an out-of-body experience after taking the drug, or sometimes they may feel like they had a near-death experience while they were on the drug. Ketamine comes in a powder or liquid form, and it can be injected, consumed, drink, snorted, or smoked. Now, the drug has actually been used as a date rape drug, which is very unfortunate, and because of that, in 1999, it was made a controlled substance in the United States. This is the drug that people can slip into your drink and it will just knock you out and you have no recollection of what happened that night. So it's quite scary, but at low doses it is showing promise for treating depression. Now, ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist and so to understand what kind of effects ketamine has we'd have to understand what NMDA receptors are responsible for. So the way NMDA receptors work is they bind to glutamate. Now glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. Glutamate actually first binds to these receptors called AMPA receptors, which are on the same neurons as NMDA receptors. And AMPA receptors, after they bind to glutamate, will allow the cell to depolarize by causing sodium to flood into the cell. Once the cell depolarizes, NMDA receptors can become active. And this is because NMDA receptors are usually blocked by a magnesium ion. But after depolarization happens, the magnesium ion moves out of the way, and so we can have further depolarization through the NMDA receptor. So basically, for the NMDA receptor to open, the other channels have to be activated first. Now, once the NMDA receptor opens, calcium can flood into the cell. And calcium is very important for its epigenetic role. 
So what this means is that calcium can have a downstream signaling effects. And a lot of these include things like changing the amount of translation of DNA to mRNA and the amount of transcription of certain RNAs to proteins. So this can change the whole composition of the cell. It can change the amount of proteins. And what it actually does is we have an upregulation of AMPA receptors to increase the excitability of the cell. Now both AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors work hand in hand for learning. So we need activation of the NMDA receptors in order for new synapses to form. And this is very important in the hippocampus. The whole process is actually called long-term potentiation because we have this long-term effect of synaptogenesis and synaptic connections forming to form memory substrates within the brain. So the reason that we may experience amnesia after being anesthetized with ketamine is because it is impacting this whole system and so the hippocampus can't process the way it usually does. It might explain some of the side effects like agitation, confusion, hallucinations that we see when people are treated with ketamine. So if this drug seems to knock people out completely, then why was it ever looked into for treating depression? Well, it was first actually explored in the early 2000s when low doses were shown to decrease suicide ideation in individuals. And these effects were seemingly instant compared to SSRIs and TCAs. But because of the effects that it has, it can have high abuse potential due to the euphoria it can cause and the hallucinations that it causes at high doses. So before we look into how the mechanism of action might be improving depression, we're gonna actually just look at a study that showed that this improvement in depression happens, first of all. So what we look at to diagnose a depressed individual is based on the Diagnostic Statistics Manual. And to be diagnosed depressed, the person has to have experienced two or more weeks of low mood or anhedonia. Anhedonia is just when nothing really phases you, it doesn't really make you feel happy, you don't find pleasure in experiences that are usually pleasurable. So two or more weeks of low mood and anhedonia, and then four or more of the other symptoms that are listed in the manual. This one study looked at treatment resistant depressed individuals. And so people who are treatment resistant have to have gone through two or more different treatments and seen no result. So in last week's video, where we actually looked at using psilocybin to treat depression, this was actually looking at treatment resistant individuals as well. And with ketamine, we're looking at the same thing. In the study I'm going to talk about, it's a randomized control trial where they looked at how ketamine can influence patients in three different phases. So patients were either given ketamine or midazolam. Midazolam is an active placebo, and so that was used as the control group. Phase one was basically used to test the efficiency of ketamine. And as you can see in the figure, what was done was patients were either given ketamine first or midazolam first, and then afterwards they were switched and crossed over to the different group where they were either given midazolam or ketamine. Now, in order for them to receive the second treatment, it had to be at least seven days after their first treatment, and they had to return to 80% of their original depression score. So there had to be a kind of relapse if they improved. So what was seen in this phase of the study was that patients who were treated with ketamine had a significant decrease in their depression rating. And so 24 hours later, around 24% of the patients met the antidepressant criteria. It was working in 24% of the people that were treated. And if we look at the figure, you can see that people that were treated with ketamine saw a significant reduction up to 24 hours later, and then it kind of relapsed. And then if you look at the responders versus the non-responders, when we take out the individuals who didn't see an effect, we see a larger influence by the ketamine. So that was phase one. 
and we can see that ketamine has a greater effect than midazolam. Phase two was done in order to test the reinstatement during relapse. So after patients relapsed back to their normal depression rating, they were reinstated with ketamine again three times a week and this was done in order to see the effects of ketamine treatment when it was upkept throughout the week. And what we saw was that in the total sample, the people with ketamine saw a reduction in depression rating, whereas the midazolam patients didn't see too much change. When we took out the non-responders and kept people who were only having high response to the drug, you could see that they reduced their depression at about a rate of two points per infusion. So each time they saw treatment, they decreased around two points on the depression scale. Finally, in phase three, this was done to test the maintenance if they only received treatment once a week. And so people who were responsive were given treatment for once a week and that was held up over four weeks. And what was seen that with the once a week dose, the patients actually remained steady throughout. And so after treatment, after lowering their depression rating, people could stay steady afterwards. So 90% of the patients that made it to phase three showed antidepressant qualities. So ketamine in the way that it acted and treated them could be labeled as an antidepressant. But how is ketamine working? Back to last week's video where we talked about psilocybin, it is thought that ketamine is probably influencing the inflammatory system just like psilocybin. Now, like I was saying last week, this is something new that's being looked into and how inflammation is involved with depression, but some things that are seen in depressed individuals is higher levels of pro-inflammatory biomarkers, things like interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and CRP. So ketamine, we already said, is a glutamate antagonist and it is seen to block depression in animal models. It is also shown to interact with levels of inflammatory proteins. So, what we've seen is that when we have an increase in glutamate, we actually have suppression of this pathway called the mTOR pathway, which is a pathway that reduces neurogenesis and plasticity. And these are all things that correlate to depression. So ketamine seems to block the NMDA receptors, which actually seems to increase the activity of the AMPA receptors and can reduce the mTOR pathway. So what we see with inflammation is an increased amount of glutamate. And with the increased amount of glutamate, we have activation of NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors. Ketamine can come in and block the NMDA receptors, which selectively halts the suppression of the mTOR pathway and allows neurogenesis and allows synaptic plasticity. So what you can see in this image is that when glutamate activates the AMPA receptors, the AMPA receptors actually turn on the mTOR pathway, and the mTOR pathway causes translation of AMPA receptors, which increases the amount of AMPA receptors on the surface, and increases synaptic proteins and things like brain-derived neurotrophin factor. So, by inhibiting the NMDA receptor, we can allow this propagation to continue and we can allow there to be more synaptic proteins being made and more activation of the mTOR pathway, which is good for depressed individuals. What we also saw in induced models of depression in mice was that there is a decreased amount of brain-derived neurotropin factor and that if these mice were given ketamine before the depression was induced, this was halted and so the BDNF levels remained normal instead of decreasing while depression onset was activated. So ketamine seems to activate the mTOR pathway, which increases brain-derived neurotropin factor, that increases plasticity, and it increases the amount of AMPA receptors, which can allow this to cycle.
MBQX, which is an AMPA antagonist, was seen to block the effects of ketamine. So if we antagonize NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors at the same time, ketamine can't have an effect. But when we antagonize the NMDA receptors only and allow glutamate to activate AMPA receptors, we see the effects of ketamine through the mTOR pathway. If we look at biomarkers like interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and CRP, these levels actually decrease with ketamine. So these are pro-inflammatory biomarkers. And what was seen was that in patients who had treatment-resistant depression and who responded to ketamine treatment, these levels of interleukin-6, interleukin-beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and all these other pro-inflammatory biomarkers would reduce. They were also higher in individuals that were responsive. So people who were responsive to treatment with ketamine started off with these heightened amounts of pro-inflammatory markers. Whereas people who didn't respond but had depression didn't have higher pro-inflammatory markers. So it seems that ketamine is working on individuals who have problems with the inflammatory system comorbid to their depression. Whereas if this is not an issue, they don't seem to respond to the treatment. Something that needs to be looked into more is how inflammation can influence depression. It has been seen that things like obesity and autoimmune disorders are associated with depression. So this inflammation of the body seems to be inflaming the symptoms of depression. With that being said, that's something that future research can look into and maybe we can discuss inflammation in another video. Hopefully you learned a lot today. If you have any questions about how ketamine can be used to treat depression, feel free to ask below. If you have any questions about the papers that were commented on today, the links for each paper are in the description. Make sure you like this video, comment, suggestions for future videos or questions, and of course, subscribe. See you next week. Thanks for watching. As always, stay happy and healthy.